He came as a witness to testify to the light. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, please be seated. Grace to all those of you joining us here in the church. And grace to all those of you joining us online. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When my sister and I were little, and we would pester our parents about wanting this toy or that this time of year, my mother would try to dissuade us always by saying the same thing, and always in the same way. It's close to Christmas, is what she would say. Now, over time, we knew that phrase by the odd mixture of excitement and disappointment which it brewed in our stomachs. Excitement because mom had a habit only of saying, it's close to Christmas, about things she was going to buy us. But it was disappointment because it's close to Christmas meant we were not going to get them now, wherever we were, in the Walmart or what have you. New video game, it's close to Christmas, means you're going to get it, but no chance that you're going to get it now. <laughs> and that, friends, I think, is a, it was a lesson to me as a kid in what anticipation really is. Excitement and disappointment blended together. Taught me what anticipation is. In some ways, it taught me what life is. Today is the third in a series of sermons for the season of Advent. Each of these sermons has taken on one of the so-called four last things, four experiences to be had by the soul at the last, as it were. Traditionally, these four last things have been thought by the church to be appropriate to meditate on in preparation for the joy of Christmas. Their death, judgment, heaven, and hell. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> We've taken... You, you've... <laughs> Today is not death and it's not judgment. We've already taken care of those. Today we're into heaven. Next Sunday, don't miss it. We're in for hell. <laughs> and the church is, as I said, each Sunday, rather out of sync with our culture in this regard, uh, in thinking about such things in the middle of December. To say a heavenly hot chocolate is a whole lot better than prepare to die peppermint mocha, which we had the first week. But still... I hope that each time we've looked at one of these four last things, each time we've taken on these ostensibly frightening, bewildering topics, we've ended up finding some good news on the other side. The good news that in death life has changed, not ended. The good news that God's judgment is not the judgment of law, but the judgment of love. So today when we come to heaven, you and I have talked about heaven before. When we've talked about heaven before, I've said, often quoting your former rector, Richard Van Wheely, that heaven is like another dimension. It's like another dimension of our world into which I think we are all absorbed, resurrected, you could say, when we die. And the question this morning is, what is it like? <laughs> what is that other dimension like? The, the scriptures give us different images for heaven. Jesus in the Gospels often compares it to a wedding banquet, to the reception which follows the wedding ceremony. The book of Revelation says that it's like a verdant garden, kind of like a remade garden of Eden. The letter to the Hebrews says that it's like a city, but not just any city. Crucially, it's a city at peace with itself. I think all of these images point us to something about what heaven is like. Each of the images points us to something true about heaven, something that we, we can say heaven is going to be at least as good as a wedding banquet, a verdant garden, a city at peace with itself. These images show us heaven's joy, its beauty, its order. They're not exactly, though, Polaroids, photographs of what heaven is like, though. 
I'm going to try to give you a very simple definition of heaven, one that probably turned out to be pretty complicated and rich, but I have a pretty simple definition of heaven. It's the place where God gets what God wants. It's a place where God gets what God wants. It's the realm in which God gets God's way. See, there's been a little clue left for us, I think, in the Lord's Prayer. When Jesus' disciples ask Jesus how they ought to pray, he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. That's where we get it. And he tells his disciples and us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as as it is in heaven. If we slow down those words, which we memorized as kids and say over and over again, I think they imply something. If Jesus tells us to ask, to pray, to plead for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, I think that suggests that right now God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. That heaven is the place where God's will is perfectly done, and earth, this life, well, it's the place where it's not. That's why we have something to pray for. That's why it's not nonsense to pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, when God makes the earth, when God makes the world, according to the Bible, God makes the world free. Free to choose him or free not to. That's what the creation myth in the book of Genesis in the second chapter, the one with Adam and Eve and the snake and the fruit and the knowledge, uh, the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the forbidden tree. That's what I think that story is about. That's what the myth is about. It's about the fact that we're free free to choose God, not to choose God, that we very often don't choose God. It's very often what we in our world do, and it makes our world a mixed bag of God's will and ours. A mixed bag of things which look like heaven and things which don't. A mixed bag of butterflies and hurricanes. Weddings and genocides, sunsets, and betrayals. God lets the world have its own way, as it were, for a time. But he does so with a proviso, a disclaimer, which is that he's not going to let the world have its way the whole time. He's not going to let the world fall into such disrepair he cannot fix it. And fix it, he does, according to the Bible, according to Christians. He fixes it in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. God fixes the world when it's chosen against him by coming to the world anew. God fixes everything by coming to us. And this is what John the Baptist is continually foretelling in the Scriptures. We read one version of it last week from the Gospel of John. We read another version this week from, excuse me, last week was the Gospel of Mark. This week was the Gospel of John. In each case, John the Baptist is a forerunner. He's saying God is coming anew into the world in Christ. John is always saying that the God who made the world, who came to the world subsequent to the fall as the God of Israel, that this God is coming again into the world, another time in Jesus of Nazareth. And this God is going to come to each and every one of us in our time. That is the Christian promise. 
that God will come to us, come to our aid, and help us. We get God in this life by degrees, I think, over time. More of him, and more of him, and more of him. As God comes into our lives in a new, surprising way each time. See, God is not just the director of the play of the world. God's not even just the playwright. God becomes an actor in the play. And God bursts onto the scene in ways we cannot predict. Coming into the play again to fix things over and over and over again. God seems to love bursting onto the scene whenever we least expect him to do so. And when we burst onto his scene, when we die, and we get heaven all at once, I think we will recognize it by the little glimpses of heaven we've seen on earth. Those moments in our world where God's will is actually done on earth as it is in heaven. We get glimpses of heaven in those moments when God is coming to us and everything seems to line up. When the world goes right, when our broken relationships are restored, when our diseases are cured, when our hoped for accomplishments are realized, that's heaven on earth. And life has such moments mixed in with all of the rest. But we spend a lot of our time, don't we, waiting to see which way it's going to go. Whether in this particular case, God's will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We spend a lot of time waiting for Jesus to come. Waiting for Christmas. This year, you and I have waited on a great deal together. We have asked Jesus to come many times. We have buried people we loved. We have prayed for each other when we were sick. We have hurt for a world that is torn apart by war. We've longed for our lives just to come together. We've done that together. This is what churches are for. They're places where we wait for Christmas, as it were. And many of you know that I pray most 